Good. With or without Alan. All right. If you remember, we developed this bond, this uh, this new idea of entropy as a property, and in fact, is the last, possibly the most important uh, of our well. With enthalpy, I think. I think enthalpy and entropy are two of the most important properties we had. But uh, came to us, if you remember from this idea, that the heat transfer, if reversible, which means from a very, very small delta T, so it's kind of an idealized idea. Um, but if we go from that to the uh, integral of this, then we can really see that entropy is indeed a property. Because of the fact that if we look at the entropy all the way around the cycle, then of course we come back to the same spot that where we started. Uh, which means the change in entropy for a cycle is going to be zero, which means then that the uh, uh, entropy itself is a, is a property, a proper property. This S, again, is uh, uh, for the extensive version of entropy, just like we've done with our other um, properties where we can uh, do it on a mass basis or do it on a total basis. We can even do it on a molar basis, but we don't do that very often. Then for isothermal processes, of course this integrates out and then we can that uh, T delta S is uh, directly a result of that, uh, that heat transfer. So that's kind of the places where we've gotten, uh, I think we've got just a little bit beyond that. Um, because it allows us now to compare real and reversible processes and get some idea of just how we are doing with real processes and thus real cycles if we can put this all together. For real processes, this quantity is going to be uh, more than just that one, which would have been due to the reversible heat transfer. And then we can put uh, these two things together to look at the total entropy change that's going to be a little bit due to this reversible entropy change due to the heat transfer that's the ideal part but then the real part is that we're also going to increase it. We're going to generate some entropy due to irreversibilities. And it's that, that, uh, that, uh, that generation term they can give us an idea of just what's going on in the picture. If that's equal to zero for some process, then we must have a reversible process and vice versa. If it's greater than zero, then we have the deal we're talking about here, that there are irreversible irreversibilities present.
which is a very real thing, very real possibility. If we find this generation term to be less than zero, then the process is impossible. And we looked at that as one of the sample problems where we had that uh, some kind of some kind of a claim by some inventor or something. We found out that the entropy generation would be less than zero, and thus it was impossible. So let's give or take a little bit uh, what we've gotten up to for uh, our new look at this property entropy. And it allows us to look at real and ideal processes. For example, um, expansion through a turbine. diagram uh, if it happens to be a say a water turbine or an R134 turbine which those aren't very common um, we might see a process through the turbine where uh, if it's an ideal reversible turbine it would then have no entropy change but due to the realities of it, what we're really going to see is the reversibilities, irreversibilities, cause an increase in the entropy. So what we sometimes do is we'll put a little S on that subscript. That would be the outlet state point given an irreversible, sorry, given a reversible process down to that point. But the reality of the situation is that we're going to see increases in entropy and we'll actually finish at some other point, uh, but still at the same outlet pressure. And for compressors, We can see the same type of thing with work input here, where we might have a ideal process takes place something like that. Remember the lines are very, very close together over there so that you see a very short uh, uh, process line there. But due to irreversibilities, we're actually going to finish somewhere to the right of that with increased entropy. And we'll look at that in more detail in a little bit. Probably Friday we'll get to that. Okay, some other stuff we need to do with it. All this to help us find the entropy. Um, we can start with the first law and assume it to be a reversible <coughs> version of it. We know that that's going to cause an increase in the uh, energy of the system. So uh, this first look will be with a closed 
compressible, a closed system with a compressible working fluid. And reversible. We know already, as we've seen before, that this work um, symbolism. You know, it's the same. This, remember, we just looked at, that's um, and so we can put those together in the first of what are called the TDS equations, not tedious, TDS. Sorry, that should not be a delta, it should be a V. Since we haven't integrated it yet. Jeez. Yeah, no, screw you up. This is known as the first of the Gibbs equation. If you remember, there were three brothers Gibbs who made the Bee Gees. Now this is the first of their equations. Yeah. They sang this one. Andy, Andy was on his own, right? For a while. Yeah. So was, was Barry and Barry and uh, and and, uh, uh, and Alfred. Is it Albert? I don't know. Don't you know that? <laughs> just the just the Bee Gees. Yeah, they were huge. I know, man. And you ought to hear them sing this. It's wonderful <laughs> when when put to music. It just the whole thing that's it's so much better. All right, so that's the first of the Gibbs equations. Now we can do a little bit extra with it. Remember this little fact of ours. That we had this this uh, <coughs> idea that enthalpy would be a, it's mostly a matter of convenience and just saves writing you know, u plus pv all the time. But we can put these two together, integrate this. I'm sorry, differentiate this side. do the chain rule on that part, of course. And du plus pdv, we've already got there, so we can put these together as tds plus or equals dh plus v d. Should be minus, yeah. Because, yeah, because it, it comes over. Yeah, because that comes over. And that's the second of the Gibbs equations. And there isn't a third because you're right, and you left the band. He did pretty well on his own, didn't he? Yeah. I think he didn't die as part of it. <laughs> the other two did. No, no, he's the one that died. Oh, he's the one that died? Well, two of them died. Well, oh, well, Alan, I'm sorry I had to break that. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to <laughs> I mean but, but the big death was the end. Yeah, yeah the other one was a little death. Yeah. <laughs> that was way later. Yeah, the other uh, like, a, like a death lick. <laughs> death <-ino. Yeah. laughs> a little tiny. Little tiny death there. 
It probably matters to him, but what you're saying is it doesn't matter to you. Well, it does. <laughs> Evidently, a little bit. Okay, so uh, we can take this business here and uh, don't forget, we can divide through by the mass, so it can be done on a per mass basis. We can take the uh, first Gibbs equation, divide through by t, and we get uh, our next little step with it. If the uh, fluid is incompressible, then of course dV is zero. We get dU over T. And values right from the table at particular temperatures. And those we can get right out of the tables.
Uh, yeah, on a per mass basis for this problem. Okay, so that's one way to do it. We can do use the saturation values. Just go to the temperature table at the right temperatures. So remember, this is in degrees C. So we have to do it at the right temperatures. What's uh, what's uh, 300 is, is what about 37 degrees? So if we look at 37 degrees, 27, yeah. we see that the saturated vapor, uh, sorry, the uh, liquid value for entropy is somewhere in between those two. And that's for the that's for the first point, uh, and you can interpolate that to be about 3950, give or take a little bit, if you get the 27 degrees in between there. Just means that you're 40% of the way between these two because you're 40% of the way through on the temperature. So we're just assuming a, a straight interp interpolation for those numbers. So something like 3950, remember the units are kilojoules, kilogram per degree K. What? Then for the other one, what is that? 50 degrees? And so you just use the 703, that one's right out of the table. What's that come out to be? About three oh eight eight. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, that's using the tables. The other way to do it is use a simple assumption that we can, if we can find that specific heat for liquid, we can just do the uh, calculation that way. And of course we have water turns out to be actually a common liquid. And so at those temperatures, it looks like it's about 4.18. And that's in the proper units. And then log of the two uh, two temperatures, what three twenty three over three hundred. And that comes out to be Phil's gonna get the award money for figuring it out. All your fees low. You got it on the you bother doing any work. You already got it? How do you have to get oh, the award money? What'd you get? Point three zero eight. Very much the same. So which one do you use when? The tables, as long as you've got them for the temperatures you need, always work. Uh, the reason, the main reason these two are very close together is that the delta T in the process isn't that big. So C sub B uh, needs some pretty good del delta P's to change significantly. We don't have that on this one. Uh, this does fine if the delta T's aren't very big. The delta T's are much bigger than C sub P isn't really a, a constant, but a lot of that stuff is, is available. If you need to, if you're worried about uh, C, sub C, C sub P or C sub B, doesn't matter much, changing, notice that for, here's the 
temperatures here. For bigger temperatures, we do get kind of a change through this. You can always just use an average value between the two and that'll work uh, uh, just about as well. But again, if you've got the tables, uh, use them if you got them. Sometimes it's a matter of how fast you need to go, how accurate you need to be, or whether even the tables are available to you. Okay, so let's see, we had that last little Gibbs equation. Ideal gas, we can make a couple little changes. One is that du equals c sub b dt. before. 
the log of the ratios. And the other one becomes Same kind of thing, very similar, only we're using the enthalpy equation. And then integrate that part times R, the ratio of the pressures. This time I caught the minus sign. don't necessarily need both of these because if you have one of them you can get to the other one if you happen to remember that the difference between the specific heats is the uh, gas constant for that particular gas. So if you've got the gas constant and you've got C sub P you automatically have C sub B and you don't necessarily have to do that. What's useful to us, though, is this part right here in that that's entirely a function of T, which means it can be tabulated. So uh, it allows us to, to find a new, well, it's not necessarily a property, to find S0 as the integral from zero to some temperature of interest of just that ratio. So those are all already done, tabulated, and made of use to us as we'll double check in a second. Because it's all just a function of temperature so it's very easy to have somebody else do those and tabulate them. So then the, this value between two temperature limits, as we have in processes, is going to be then S0 at the second one, second temperature, minus S0 at the first one. And that's pretty easy to do. So let's uh, look at an air process between two temperatures, 300K, one bar, and 1000K, three uh, bar. find the entropy change. Okay, we have it on pressure basis, not on a volume basis, so certainly the other one is the easiest one to do. second one there. But we don't want to do that integral, so we'll use this newly defined property S0. And all those little parts are easy to find. So you uh, gas constant, we just look up the two pressures we are given. doesn't even matter what units they are as long as they're in the same units. And the uh, ST, I'm sorry, the S0, we can just look up. So we look at table 17, ideal gas properties of air.
and you see what we have here are two sets of columns from 200 to 570 and then 580 up to 1240 and S0 is now given in the last one. Again, that's this value here integrated from zero to the temperature of interest. It's in degrees Kelvin, so we need uh, S2 is at 1,000. So that's down here. 1,000 degrees, S0 is the very last column, 29677. gases or especially air I don't remember offhand if we have the, that S not for other gases uh, it has, has a, for example here's oxygen it does have them but it's on a molar basis so just be careful with that watch your units nitrogen is also on a molar basis but the air is on a mass basis. So, I don't know about you, it makes it a little easier in my mind. Okay, so let's let you do a little bit. Because <laughs> very few of you have been working hard enough this morning to stuff. Frozen. So, this is water at 150 degrees C saturated liquid. In a piston cylinder process. Bill? <laughs> What are you doing? Watching cat videos back there? <laughs> <laughs> that was a really funny video. You have to admit, like, that was a funny video. No, you have to grow that stuff. <laughs> it's heated in a piston cylinder device. So that means it's a closed system. And it's heated up to saturated vapor. Okay, assuming it's done reversibly, find Q, the heat added, and W, the work done. talked about this morning on how to find the, uh, how to relate this to the enthalpy changes, assuming it's done reversibly.
can draw the process what would this process look like on a PV diagram that's a constant pressure process from saturated liquid to saturated vapor so we're just going to go right across the dome. What's the area under a process line on a PV diagram? That's the work. So there's the work there. You can find those parts. diagram. Dome's a little bit different shape, but uh, that's not terribly crucial. We're just trying to get an idea from these things. What's the process look like on a TS diagram? Why would it be straight across? We're under the dome. We're not changing pressure. We're not changing temperature either. So uh, it's going that process is going to look like that. Is the area under a TS diagram significant? Only if it's reversible. Only if it's reversible, and I said assuming this is reversible. So what's the area under a TS diagram? That's Q. You need to find the uh, two volume pieces and you need the two entropy pieces as well. since that's what we've got. We've been given the temperature. So at 150 degrees, there's your pieces across there. Remember that uh, they don't do it for volume, but they do it for the other ones. They conveniently already subtract these for you. And so, You can save yourself a little bit of trouble by just pulling that single number out of the tables.
there's uh, if you're on the internet, there are lots of sites where you can put in stuff you know, and it'll just look up the values for you. It's just that doesn't work so good. And, well, it does work on tests because you guys cheat on every test you take. So. All right, so all we're looking for is P delta B. P is the pressure given here as a saturation pressure. That's the 76. Delta V. If you're in a real hurry, notice that the delta V's are very, very, uh, since VF is very, very small, that you can, uh, can just use VG if you need it. That's, I think, why they don't put the convenience of the difference of the two in there. 392, 248. units for for work system and by our convention that's positive and that's how the numbers come out anyway that's how the area comes out anyway heat added to the system is positive another way to do this same one that was uh, using the entropy to find the heat transfer since it was conveniently a reversible process but also could have found the 
enthalpy change, and you would have gotten the same number. And if you check those values there, notice that there's almost the precise number we had, the 2113 uh, under HFG, which is just what we want. So, convenient when they're reversible. As is the Carnot cycle. We haven't looked at that on a TS diagram yet. Remember how the Carnot cycle worked? What was the, the first of the processes, at least as we numbered them? It was an isothermal heat addition. Well, in fact, that's what we have right here. So the first part of the process was something like that. What was the second part? Adiabatic, which if you remember, and remember these are all reversible, so if a process is reversible and adiabatic, there's no entropy change. So the third process, uh, sorry, the second process on a TS diagram for the Carnot cycle looks like that. The third process for our Carnot cycle, isothermal again, compression, and then the fourth process was a uh, again, an adiabatic, uh, adiabatic uh, um, expansion. So this is true. The Carnot cycle on a TS diagram looks like this no matter where the dome is. So it looks like this for any working fluid with or without phase change, which is kind of convenient for it all. And the area enclosed by that cycle it's Q net because that's what we get right off the TS diagram but don't forget for a cycle and this is true for any cycle Q, that's my favorite type, Q net equals work net. So that's not just the heat transfer enclosed in there, it's also the network. That's the main thing we get off of the TS diagram is the network. into a water bath. Okay, uh, I'll improve things a little bit by making the chambers insulated. The initial temperature on the copper is 80 degrees C. Yeah, copper, kind of this bright red stuff. Um, the water was at 25 degrees C. And we have how much copper? 
50 kilograms. Wow, at today's prices, that's awesome. That's why we won't actually be doing this experiment. And 120 liters of the water. So, let's make sure I got all the pieces. Initial temperature of each, amount of each, temperature, and that'll be of both, because that'll be the equilibrium temperature of the two. Once the copper cools down and the water heats up a little bit, sooner or later they're at the same temperature. So find that temperature. Also find the total entropy change. means you have to find the entropy change of the water and of the copper. Leave that up there in case we need any values. We have a request for the specific heat of copper offhand. Offhand, since I have that memorized, it's, no I haven't memorized use copper and ideal gas, I think it is. There's the right table. Part of common liquid solids and foods. So I don't have to tend to turn it far enough. Table A3. Should have a copper as a food. See, it's not an ideal gas, it's a food. Nope, it's not on the table. Next one. Mm -hmm. There it is. And changes a bit. Um, so you can you can do the. Uh, you can eyeball it from 80 is max down to 25. Uh, maybe just put it somewhere in between. Average the two of them. 0.39 might work. Insulated. So one of the things you're going to want to use is the fact that whatever heat the copper loses, the water gains. So that's one of your working equations there. Uh, shouldn't involve 
entropy on that one, we can do that one just with straight with the uh, specific heats and the temperatures. Then, of course, the last part of it, we need the, the entropy changes. Copper's going to lose some entropy because of the heat transfer from it, and the system's going to gain some entropy. If that they come out to be the same, then you know the process is reversible. I hope you know it isn't. And 
know that's equal and opposite to the energy change of the water, because that's the only place that heat can go. And then that's the same thing. careful with our indices because they both finish at the same temperature but they don't start at the same temperature so those two being equal and opposite the only unknown you have is T2 and you can solve for the equilibrium temperature you have it final temperature and opposite yep so you can get halfway out of class you can move over to here oh okay well that's your choice so the fact these are equal and opposite then, the only unknown is this T2 in the equation you can solve for it. That makes sense, Malcolm? Okay. For delta T's, you don't need to put them in degrees Kelvin. No. Because you add 273 to that and add it to that. Since you're subtracting them, that 273 just cancels. You won't hurt anything there other than takes uh, another second or two to do that. But with delta T, a uh, uh, change in degrees in Kelvin or Celsius is the same size. Even though the temperatures themselves are not. Okay?
Einstein brothers too. Why doesn't that make you smarter? How's this look? For the total, looks even worse.
the entropy change of the water, whatever those two might be. For either one, it's the same general idea. Depends upon how much of that you have. We know the 50 kilograms. The specific heat, and uh, if you remember for the compressible substances, then the entropy change comes out to be that, just the log of the temperatures. And we now have the temperature change from the first part. This ratio must be in degrees Kelvin. And see, just look up in the look up in the book under copper. We had that, didn't we? That's right. We looked under uh, common foods for copper. Mm -hmm. Tasty stuff. Yeah, man. For copper, use uh, 0 0.39. So we have the mass of the copper, the specific heat of the copper, you have the original temperature and this new equilibrium temperature just found from the first part. Just make sure those are in degrees Kelvin, that ratio. Thank you. 